everyone. Uh, welcome to our first of four sessions of Selling Food to Ontario, Creating a Buzz About Bees in Ontario. We'll just give a moment. I can see um, people are, are joining into to the webinar. So we'll just do a few introductory uh, remarks and, and comments as, as we allow people to sort of transition out of the waiting room into the meeting and I'll start, I'll introduce myself. My name is Carolyn Peterborough. I work for the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, so OMAFRA, as an Agricultural and Rural Economic Development Advisor. And you'll meet one of my colleagues, Karen Fisher, a, a little bit later when, when she presents. And we're very happy at OMAFRA to have partnered with the Ontario Beekeepers Association to deliver this uh, series of workshops. So this is, a, as I said, the first of four Selling Food to Ontario webinars. Uh, and we, the reason we have worked together to create these workshops is often uh, we hear from retailers or grocery um, store chefs, other food buyers that are looking for local product and um, they don't really know where to find it. And then we'll also hear from those who produce local products such as, such as bee or honey products. And um, often people have trouble finding channels beyond that sort of end of the driveway type marketing options to be able to, to sell their product. Uh, so there's that disconnect that, that happens between the people and, and how they do business and, and, and growing, growing and producing honey products. So the, the, the goal of this series of webinars is to help um, bridge that disconnect and, and build uh, information and share resources and bring experts from within your own sector on how they do it and share their own experiences. So we are really uh, hope that throughout tonight's webinar and those that follow, you'll you'll get to learn about you know what are customer expectation, what are some of those market channels that exist, and what are some of the business strategies to sell your your products through various market channels. So we will be covering a range of topics tonight uh, as part of the market channel opportunities. And we'll be hearing from a variety of speakers and I'll, I'll uh, go on to the next slide in a moment uh, to share, share this. As I mentioned earlier, this is a partnership between the Ontario Beekeepers Association and the Community Economic Development uh, Priority Area within uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and, and Rural Affairs. Just share the agenda for the night with you on, on the screen. Uh, so we'll start with uh, our welcome introductions. And I'd just like to take a moment now uh, before I go through, through the agenda to do a, a territorial acknowledgement. So although we are joining virtually tonight, I would like to share acknowledgement for where, where I live. Uh, so I uh, reside in, in Durham region and I am grateful to live and work on the lands of the traditional terio, uh, territory of the Mississaugas of the Scugog Island First Nation. I'm a settler in Canada, and like all settlers, I have benefited from colonialism. My ancestors were of Mennonite heritage, and in 1807, they left Pennsylvania and crossed into what is now Ontario, and that was to seek an existence that was more aligned with their Mennonite values. They settled in the Markham area initially and made their home in um, Altona, a small village at the north end of what is now Pickering Township in the 1850s and later our family moved uh, further east in Durham region. At the time of my ancestors' settlement, it was the Mississaugas um, who inhi inhibited that north shore of, of Lake Ontario, including where my home is now. A decade or so before my ancestors settled in Canada, the Governor Simcoe ordered that Whitby, Pickering and 10 other townships be declared open to settlers. And those records indicate there were about 800 settlers living in the township at that time. The area was heavily wooded and my ancestors, as many of the other settlers, served to what would be a farming legacy. And that farming legacy continues in my family to, to uh, this day. So although the federal government plan for the second Toronto area ended Track, second Toronto area airport ended where I used to live in that particular piece of land. I can't think, but um, think back to that early 1800s and wonder what were the interactions that took place between my ancestors and the Mississaugas. The removal of forests for farmland would have removed game and hunting ground from the Mississaugas who roamed the swath of land between Lake Ontario and the Oak Ridge Moraine, and they would have you know, they had lived off the land and, and the water, and that would have 
really resulted in a permanent land change and how they lived uh, and, and their, their um, sort of the success of their lives. So I reflect often and think on how I might in my actions, either personally or professionally respond and somehow return balance to what I have benefited from and those who do not have the same privileges as me. As a settler, I've begun a journey to learn about the negative and unforgivable impacts of colonialism have had on indigenous people. This land acknowledgement will serve as a reminder of the past and the ongoing harms of the residential schools and colonialism. I have and will continue to explore what reconciliation looks like in my life and how I can create a way of life that incorporates reconciliation actions regularly and consistently. So thank you for uh, taking part in listening to my land acknowledgement tonight. As we look at the agenda tonight, we have, uh, we're opening with, uh, we'll have Melanie talk about who the Ontario Beekeepers Association is. We will then invite Michelle Wolfson to talk to, about connecting to you, your, your customer. And then we have a great um, series of speakers on market channel opportunities. We'll begin with Karen Fisher, my colleague from OMAFRA. And then we have producers perspective. We'll have John Val Alton, Emily Bertha and Gavin North will, will share their perspectives on, on those opportunities. And then we'll have an opportunity at the end for some questions for speakers. And I do have an evaluation poll. I'll put the, the link into the chat so that yeah, if you would take some time to click that and, and fill it out, that would be wonderful. So at this time, I will turn uh, the, the mic over to Melanie to, to share uh, who is OBA. Thanks, Carolyn. So yes, um, I am just going to say a, a brief thing about uh, the Ontario Beekeepers Association here tonight. Um, it could be that most or all of you are, are members uh, of the Ontario Beekeepers Association, but if you're not uh, and you're interested to know more, uh, I'm always here to, to answer questions. You can reach me uh, at info at ontariob.com or you can check out our website, which is ontariob.com. And that's B with two E's. Um, and, uh, and that's a, a good starting point. Just check out our website. But if you are interested to know kind of what the OBA is about, um, we work to basically ensure a sustainable beekeeping industry in Ontario. Uh, we advocate for the beekeepers, their interests. We try to support and, and promote the management of healthy honeybee populations. And this is for, you know, pollination services and honey production and general, you know, environmental um, sustainability. And we recognize that there are varied approaches to beekeeping. Um, everyone kind of has their own approach and their own target and their own uh, reason to be in the industry. But the target goal is a prosperous industry with the widespread public appreciation for our honey, our hive products, and the critical role that, that honeybees play in agricultural in general. We are committed to responding um, quickly and thoughtfully to, to urgent issues, uh, engaging in ongoing dialogue with members and local associations. We partner with a broad range of organizations and initiatives, and we strive to provide information and training that is based on the most up-to-date research uh, while protecting the environment. So membership does give you some perks, um, helps you save money on things like meetings and conferences, workshops, advertising, uh, and you do have access to things like uh, honey and bee related group liability insurance that is quite affordable um, and easily protects you and your products. We also you know, hope to help you connect to other beekeepers uh, and work on a common approach to promoting and protecting the honeybees and wild pollinators in Ontario. Part of your membership, you get a subscription to the Ontario Bee Journal. Uh, and also because we are members of Canadian Honey Council, you will get the quarterly publication of Hive Lights, which comes from that national organization. We also have a tech transfer program, which uh, does research and advice, and they are technical beekeeping specialists, so you can learn a lot through them and their projects and their research. And of course, as a member, you would be able to present and vote on resolutions at our annual general meeting of members. And you can also do things like get involved um, in active leadership and volunteer roles in the OBA, or even run for the board and be on one of our many committees. 
We provide as much information as we can on government funding programs that are specific to beekeepers, insurance programs and support programs that can help you through your, your, uh, your business. And there's also sub associations. So we have the Bee Breeders Association, the um, Honey Bee Pollination Association, the Mead Makers Association of Ontario. And these are all other ways in which you can join into the industry. We also have web-based directories where you can profile your business, your sales of honey and your bees and your supplies. Um, so these are all ways that you can get involved into the OBA. And I'm just going to do a little plug right now. We are working on a five-year strategic plan to focus our attention and needs uh, to the future of what the OBA is going to do for, for the members. So if you'd like to uh, you know, get to, uh, your hands right in there, you can fill out the survey to kind of guide us and what you would hope to, to expect from the OBA in the next five years uh, and give us a bit of feedback on, on how you think things are going. So um, I'll be sending that email out tomorrow to bring attention again to the strategic plan, but I do encourage everyone to fill it out. Um, and there are prizes. So, you know, there's that. <laughs> but that's uh, if you need any more information about the OBA, again, just uh, feel free to contact me and uh, I will I will do my best to answer all your questions. Great. Thank you, Melanie. What a great overview. And you can't get better than prizes. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I will now turn it back over to you, Melody, to, to introduce Michelle. So yes, our first uh, keynote speaker tonight, or the only keynote speaker tonight, is uh, is Michelle uh, Michelle Wolfson. So um, Michelle has been a beekeeper for approximately eight or nine years. Um, currently manages apiaries all the way from Muskoka to Toronto. Uh, works and uh, helps plan and run the Urban Toronto Beekeepers Association and uh, also moderates the Ontario Women's Beekeeping Network Facebook group, um, which is a great resource for the, the, the booming side of the industry in which the females are, are, are getting involved in. Um, so there's a, a really cool aspect of Michelle in that she has designed and built a mobile honey extraction trailer, uh, which means that uh, if you have honey that needs to be extracted and you don't have one yourself, she can come to you. And she's also currently on uh, the board of directors with the OBA, um, basically kind of getting her hands in there and, and working to promote and encourage and strive to help the beekeepers in Ontario. So welcome, Michelle. Okay, so um, as Melanie said, uh, I've, I've been beekeeping for only about eight years. But before I was a beekeeper, um, a long time ago, I used to work for the Toronto Star in the marketing department. And after that, uh, for 25 years, I worked as a professional chef and I ran the food service in um, private clubs, but I was also a personal chef and um, uh, did a lot of um, side, side work. So I spent a lot of time promoting my business. I've been self-employed for the last 25 years. So I got a real feel for how to um, make sure that I always had clients coming to my door. And I try to extrapolate that into my beekeeping business, which is, you know, I, I loosely say business. I don't know. It, 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 is, it, is, it is a business, a big, a, big, a big hobby that costs money too. But the key um, with my presentation is that it's just one beekeeper success story. And I don't want anyone to think that I'm telling them that they should do anything at all that I do, what I'm hoping is that I will share with you the things that have worked for me. And if they resonate for you, um, th they might be ways that maybe you can increase your business. So one of the things that I always have in my business is a business plan, despite the fact that I'm just a beekeeper. Um, I think it's really important to, um, if you do have a financial goal for yourself, to be able to work out how you're going to make that goal and how, how you're going to, um, if you're going to, if you uh, pay your bills from your beekeeping, then how you're going to make sure that happens. And I'm not going to go over any part of the business side, but I do just kind of want to talk about target markets, mostly from the perspective of being able to understand who your buyers are and making sure that all of the marketing activities that you use are marketing activities that meet, that, that will be intersecting with your buyers. 
I refer to in this, you know, very formal little um, <clears throat> thing in the corner here on market segmentation, talking about, you know, demographics and beekeepers selling honey anyways, really just work off of psych- psychographic and behaviors. And that means that our segments of people who buy honey from us as hobbyists and um, uh, farm farm gate uh, sales are really people to whom honey places a high value um, you know, when they go to um, purchase it, they place a high value on knowing who the beekeeper is, where it's coming from, and all of the quality components of it. If you look at the kind of people who buy, I'm in a very, I'm I'm in Muskoka, but I'm also in a large urban center a uh, half the time. And I know that the psychographics, the little ones that I have down there are just examples of how I can, uh, I wanted to be able to connect with you to say that if part of your markets that you know that when people buy honey from you, these are moms with small children that go to yoga classes and cook at home and shop organic, then when you're ever you're planning any marketing plans for your honey, you need to think of that. Or on the male side, if they're hunters and anglers who spend time woodworking and drive electric cars, same thing. I'm not suggesting that these are the only people who buy honey, but what I'm suggesting is that if you are going to market to specific hobby or hobby Facebook groups, or if you're going to attend markets or shows, make sure they're ones that um, fit with the kind of people who want to buy quality raw uh, honey from a beekeeper that they know. And truthfully, that beekeeper that they know thing, that's my unique selling proposition. The reason why I uh, sorry, the reason for like how I center all of my marketing activities are around the expression, know the beekeeper or know your beekeeper, because my clients all know me. They don't necessarily know me personally or individually, but they know of me. They have heard of me. They have been to one of my classes. They have attended one of my camps, done one of my honey tastings, or they know somebody who has. And that's what makes, that's that's my unique selling proposition is that all my clients somehow know me. They know that I, they know my animal husbandry practices. Uh, they know I only use organic acids. They know that I don't uh, do any um, artificial feedings because I run a double brood chambers. Um, they know that my honey, I can identify where it comes from. It's ultra local. I can give you the postal code of the honey because I extract it in ba- batches. Melanie said, I have an extraction trailer, makes it really easy for me. But I am a trusted source of honey. Anytime those conversations come up about adulterated honey and all that kind of thing that hits social media and then people go crazy thinking somehow it has anything to do with Ontario honey, which we all know it doesn't. However, when you have um, a relationship with your beekeeper, when your clients know you, you are that trusted source. And of course, I'm in the community a lot. I have the extraction trailer, but I attend a lot of fairs if I think that the fairs are appropriate for me and are what I want to do. I want to show you um, my most recent Facebook post because this is something that uh, is is part of this fall's campaign. Um, and it's because I have a black queen and that's, I, I just took that picture like, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago and, and she's beautiful, but she's all black. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to capitalize on that because how often do you have like a really like sexy looking black queen like that? So um, my marketing this year um, for all of the honey that comes out of the hives where this black queen has lived and kind of the neighboring hives too, but let's just say those hives um, are um, from my, uh, my um, Toronto apiary that happens to have linden trees all up and down the street. So I know that that hive has linden uh, honey in it and I can taste it as well. But what I was able to do was kind of like make a little funny, you know, comment about it, you know, because she's raised over 50,000 workers. I mean, this was her first season. She's a brand new queen. So I know that she's, you know, really productive. And I also know that, um, the honey in there has a lot of linden in it because I got five linden trees on my street. So that's going to be um, my fall. Uh, that's going to be my label information that I'm going to add onto, you know, the required, you know, information about honey. That's going to be kind of like what we're going to what I'm going to talk about from my Toronto hives. My selling network, though, that I create is based on the activities that I do. So I use social media to support the 
these activities. The first one, uh, media coverage. I get a lot of media coverage. Uh, this year, I've been on Zuma Radio. I've had an article in the Globe and Mail written about me. And I was on um, CBC Francophone, the Toronto CBC channel, uh, stories written about me. Why is that? Why do people interview me? Well, how do I get that coverage? Well, I'll tell you. It's because I volunteer to run beekeeping groups. And when you volunteer to run a beekeeping group, you don't get a lot, but you get but you get your name easily found on the internet. So when people are looking for somebody for a Toronto beekeeper, they find that I'm the chair of the UTBA or that I'm moderating Facebook groups and they find me and they call me and they interview me. Now, I actually don't keep all of those uh, calls to myself, by the way, because I get a lot of media requests during the year. I actually try and pass them to everybody within my group. But often I'm, I'm around or people can't get back quickly. But anyway, so if you want to get media coverage, you be that volunteer. I've never thought about that. That's a good way to raise, to, to raise volunteers, but certainly it really helps. One of the things that I did this year that I had never done before um, is I taught a day camp for uh, little beekeepers, uh, for, for students. Um, I live right beside um, the Wata Mohawk community. And so uh, I got together with the Wata Mohawk community and I ran a child children's beekeeping camp. I brought through two groups of 20 kids. We did, um, you know, a class and, and then we uh, had an observation hive. We went to the, we went up to the apiary. Uh, we had all kinds of fun activities, but what that does is it creates a connection within the community. It means that the children know who I am, the adults who know who I am, the organizers know who I am. And when people want to buy or think honey, they think me. Now, I don't do it really to sell honey. I, I really, you know, I'm a teacher by nature, so I really love it. But it's just one other thing, one other way that people are going to connect with me. The other thing I do is I run these little a day in the life of a beekeeper classes. Now they're much, much easier to organize. The day camps, you have to have, you know, you gotta have your curriculum sorted. You gotta, you gotta have, you know, you gotta, you have to be ready to, to produce a full curriculum. But a day in the life of a beekeeper, any of you should be able to pull that together. You know, just just a little bit of PowerPoint. You're talking, you know, about basic bee biology, honeybee communication, varietal honey flavors. Um, and then uh, if you're going to be doing a class with um, uh, groups that um, are interested in environmental issues, or I'm going to call them the edgier group. In my world, it's not really edgy. It's a kind of common common, but I, I talk about bee washing. I talk about organizations that use honeybees to promote their whatever they're selling or whatever that have nothing to do with the health of the honeybee. Or I talk about organizations, quite frankly, that use honeybees to promote pollination strategies. And again, that's that's bee washing. Honeybees are, are not, the, you know, the pollinator that, that we're trying to protect. It's the natives. So anyways, but these classes that I run, you can do them anywhere. You, what you need to do is just find a place that has seating and you're going to come across them. It might be your knitting shop or your coffee shop or could be a specialty retailer. The thing is, when you start doing these classes and engaging with people, you start to create your own selling network. Anybody who buys honey from you becomes a salesperson for you because they've made that intimate connection with you. Some of the other things, what else did I do? Oh, community talks. Okay, so I'm not much for politicians. Actually, I'm, I like to think of myself, my, my privilege to be apolitical. It's not true, of course, but I'm not really big on politicians. But if there is ever a group to talk to with a bunch of glad handers and handshakers who can introduce you to anybody, go talk at a political party. Fortunately, I got to talk at the um, National Conference for the Green Party, so they were very in line with my personal political beliefs anyways, but the people who attend political events and parties, they're all connected. They know industry people. They And it's not necessarily that you need to meet all of these. It's just they're really, really good at networking. And often they'll say to you, oh, you're a beekeeper? I heard about somebody that wanted to learn about beekeeping or wanted to find a somebody else, uh, you know, a source of honey that they could bring into their fill in the blank. These are the connected people. So if opportunity comes up, go and talk to them. Uh, I do speaking engagements in schools, JK to high school. There are two to three hour presentations. So they're, they're longer and you do have to have a good curriculum in that, but you can do it. And if you really need ideas on it, you know, you can always ask me, but um, schools are great because we want kids to understand about bees and pollination and regenerative agriculture. And we want kids, we want these kids are our future leaders and we want them 
to be pro honeybee so that they're pro pollinator. It's just one of those things that, you know, we want that. So even if it doesn't get you more honey sales, it's, it's just so important for kids. But the thing about schools is if you go to a private school, which I do a lot of because they have more money and they, they'll usually pay me to speak. Um, private schools often will say, gee, could the parents order honey to be delivered on the day of the speech and sent home with their kid? And I'm like, uh, yeah, sure they can. So again, it's not necessarily a specific way, but getting into classes, speaking to kids, meeting with people, you're building your selling network. It's people who've heard of you who will go on to sell, you know, to, to promote you further. I'm also um, part of the um, Swallowtail Project in uh, Toronto. It, it's part of the uh, Pollinator Pollination Stewardship Program, which is an online program that you can all take. Super valuable. I've learned a ton. And um, I, I'm working with community gardens in my area. And it really makes, because, you know, a lot of the pollinator programs are very anti-honeybee. So if you join them, then you, you stand a much better chance of understanding where they're com coming from and being able to anticipate, you know, issues and that. But also people in those pollinator stewardship programs, they actually like honey too. So they they're not entirely anti-honeybee. But what I'm trying to do is get you to think of how ways that you can intersect with members of your community in an easy way that you can drive farm gate sales generally through social media. Social media is how you'll you'll find those your, your groups on social media. They will have met you. And social media is how you'll drive them to your farm gate or to wherever your honey is sold. Uh, something else, expand. Make sure you know how to do everything with honey. If you don't know how to run a honey tasting, I'm telling you, now it's your job. Um, this is that honey tasting wheel is from the United States Honey Tasting Association. I traveled down to Connecticut to take their program. It was a wonderful two days. It was expensive, but it was just like a super holiday. Um, and, and, and of course, being a chef for 25 years, it, it was a bit of a natural for me to be able to do that. But you can do honey tastings. And these are things you charge for. I charged for the bee camp. I charge for the, I don't charge for the school ones for public schools, but I do for private schools. I charge for, when I go in and talk about honey with organizations and businesses because they all have speaker fees for budget. So it's not like you volunteering. Most of the places will be happy to pay you a speaker fee. Um, so, uh, but learn about honey, go get a whole bunch of honey, go to a store where they have varietal honeys, uh, where they're carrying, uh, the, um, uh, honeys from pollination where you can get, you know, strawberry and raspberry and blackcurrant and all those different flavors, uh, practice with them, taste them, find the profiles, and then be able to share that with other people. Also, the medicinal uses of honey. In hospitals, it's used as wound care and propolis. There's so much that you can learn about and talk about and share about that turns around. It makes you an expert. And it also, it it's like self-fulfilling. The more you know about this stuff, the more your clients depend on you for it, and the more referral business that people will send to you because they know that you're the expert in it. So how do you get money from it? You make your call to action through social media. So social media, whether it's your personal page, hobby groups, community groups, those kind of things, that's how you're going to inform them and get the word out using Instagram, websites, blogs, all of those things will drive it to you. Now, I'm not talking about Facebook Marketplace. Facebook Marketplace does not achieve the same goal. And in my opinion, it kind of pits you against all the other beekeepers in your area who are going to point out that you're $2 cheaper. So I'm not really, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being able to sell and promote through groups where, again, you are going to be able to reach the people that you intersected with or that heard about you through all the different activities that you did as beekeeper. So some of the commercial, uh, I take care of bees uh, for a, a Dexterra, which is a, um, a property management. I produce a newsletter for them a couple times a year. I keep them up to date on things. The good things about writing these newsletters for people like that is it gives you um, stuff that you can quickly put out in your Facebook feed because you've already done the research. You've already seen it. It's original. It's yours, that kind of stuff. And um, Dexterra, you know, they they get the honey from the hives that we that I manage for them. However, Everybody at Dexterra knows, like all the people who work in the building, they all know somebody and they tell somebody and they all will remember, oh, you want local honey? I remember at work, we had this beekeeper come in. Again, it's about creating that network of other people who will sell for you. Uh, retail sales. So I don't really do retail sales, mostly because I don't want to lose the margin because I don't have to. So, I mean, I'll be honest, I only sell like, you know, 20 
30 cases a year, like six thousand, seven, eight thousand dollars a year worth of honey. And that's in a good year. I certainly don't do that every year. For some people, that's like, whoa, yeah, that's a lot of honey. For other people, it's like, oh my God, I have a thousand cases. You're of no help to me. Absolutely true. I am not telling you that this is. Um, you know, this is the thing for everybody, but there is always something that even a large scale producer could be taking out of this in order to help promote their brand and help, uh, you know, uh, and help again, connect with the customer. This is a little, I got an art show here. Art shows, that's the place. People who are willing to spend $150 on a ceramic bowl, they have no problem spending $25 a kilo for my honey. Always be networking, always be thinking. So this picture, so what do you see in this picture? You see my hives are on the right and they're behind, see that there where that red arrow is? My hives are actually right behind that um, uh, scarlet trumpet vine on the other side. Obviously you can't see them, they're in my front yard. And the city is uh, tearing up the sidewalk. And so I was really concerned that um, with all that vibration that my bees were not gonna be happy, but totally not true. Bees didn't even notice it. However, what I did was um, I, I, I went out there and I was kind of looking and some of the city workers said, oh, what's, what's going on there? And I said, oh, well, I have some honeybees. I just want to make sure they weren't being bothered. And they said, oh, honeybees, that's so interesting. So there are these six, you know, kind of burly guys doing the work. Well, three of them were brothers and they were Syrian. And of course, or not, they were beekeepers back home. So they, they, they wanted to talk to me all about, oh, how do you keep bees here? And what's it like in the winter? And because, you know, the climate's really different. So they were talking to me. I ended up selling a full case say 12 12 jars that's 300 bucks like you know like you just never know but you always got to be thinking and networking and of course oh the best part about two or three weeks later i got a whole bunch of other syrian people texting me going oh my friend he bought honey at your place yeah i know it's got to be good because it comes straight from a beekeeper so again it's you know it's creating that network here i'm just gonna i know i'm probably going over on my my um my words, my uh, time allotment here. I haven't seen Melanie shaking anything at me, but I'm sure I'm close because I timed myself before. Uh, pictures, here's my day camps. So everybody, it's outside, it was COVID, but I was really lucky because I have a really, really big screen porch that uh, at my cottage where I live most of, the, most of the time. You can see the kids, they're coloring. Um, you know, we, we'd watch lessons. There's some elders there. You can see on the left, I have an observation hive. If you ever want to do presentations, it's worth its weight in gold to have an observation hive. Nothing will keep kids more engaged than an observation hive. Um, and, oh, some of the other things that I do, um, I do uh, removals. Uh, this is inside a church. And so, you know, once we removed it from the church, uh, you know, I did give the church back, you know, a couple of jars of honey, but the congreg but some of the people of the congregation was like, oh, wow, there's beekeeper. Oh, can I, you know, whatever. And it was the honey was fabulous. Um, but again, it just, it's just something else I do. And I, you know, I sent them a letter after and, you know, talked about what I do. It's just it's another, another market. Uh, I will be, I, I, I was a chef. Yes, we all know that. Uh, and I, and the only thing I do with honey, because I, I don't believe in cooking with it though, I do, I do make some candies with it. So I made honeycomb with it. Um, I actually taught a class with COBA. That's the uh, Central Ontario Beekeepers Association, just in case any of you are here. Thanks for taking my class. Um, and um, then I then I you know dipped it in uh, chocolate and and sometimes I sell it. Mostly I just eat it or give it away or whatever. But again, um, one more thing to connect me with people who like chocolate or who like candy or that that sponge toffee, that honey sp honeycomb sponge. You can make it at home. You don't have to get it just in a crunchy bar. What else? Oh, look at this. Okay, this is my very first ad on my Facebook page, 2017. You can see I'm like, I don't know what I have on my hair, like some like, you know, babushka kerchief or whatever, but I was like so incredibly happy. Like my smile is ear to ear. This is my first honey harvest. Yeah, I, I'm like where I'm still, I'm wearing gloves. I don't wear gloves anymore. I've got some kind of contraption to hold the frame. I don't do that anymore, but I was so happy to do it. Um, and there's my first label, which probably has some mistakes in it, but I printed it myself on Avery labels, you know, whatever. There's no, no logo or whatever. It's just some kind of template from them. But look at the bottom. How many people commented? That's 138 jars of honey that I sold. Big, like, like fessing up. I didn't have 138 jars of honey. I had to send some people away empty handed, but it's, it's, it's that ability to be personal and connect with people that they love and that they want to see. Right. It, 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 you know, that's, like I said, for 138 sales for a big commercial producer, that's small peanuts and maybe not even count, but for a little hobbyist, that's huge. That could be half of your thing, half of your sales. Oh, there's my, um, 
salted honey caramels, which I uh, love to make and uh, share the recipe. Uh, again, just another way to engage. I post about all kinds of things. And, my, and oh, and here's the probably the last slide. I, I collect swarms and there's nothing that will get you more information or you know, more response um, is uh, you know when you post swarm pictures. I have amazing swarm pictures. I have collect them off of parking meters, off of you name it, weird walls, floors, uh, everything. And so you just post this stuff. And what you do is you just create interest and they remember your name and they talk to you and they tell your friends about you. Um, and and I, like I said, that's how that's often how I get my speaking engagements is I'll post something like this. And then the next thing you know, some teacher will say, hey, I have a grade two class at this in this school. Would you be willing? And again, it's just a way that I connect with my clients directly but also the way I create my own sales force is all the people who buy honey from me sell honey for me. And that works for me. And um, I hope that I have given you some interesting ideas and unique ideas on um, how you might be able to add some things um, to your um, honey marketing plan. Thank you, Michelle. Wow, that was amazing. <laughs> a lot of information and... Uh... Um, uh, just a lot of passion there about uh, the work that you do with these and uh, um, very much appreciated. Um, does anybody have any questions right at this moment for Michelle um, before we move on to the next section? Thanks so much for the talk. Really appreciated. Um, lots of fantastic information. Um, I guess my, one of my questions was when you're making a marketing plan, what is your outlook? Do you normally go by week, by um, month, by year? What is kind of your schedule and how far ahead do you plan? Always plan for a full season, for a full beekeeping season. Always, always, always. Because, and then and then you're going to revisit it every year. And I have two parts of my plan. One is the financial side, how much money I need to make per season. And you know that, you, you know, you're not going to make it, uh, you're not going to be selling honey consistently. Um, so per season. Um, so I also work, if this is how much money I, uh, money I need to make, what do I need to do to make that money? So I divide that into my different categories of how much honey sales do I need to make? How many speaker fees do I need to do? Um, you know, how much, so that way I kind of can see if this is how much money I want to make, how do I need to make it? And then the other side of it is the marketing side um, is, um, I know in advance, um, you know, you know, in advance, if there are any sales or uh, things that you're going to participate in physically, where you're going to be, I know some people do those shows and things like that. And that art market, I, I sold $800 worth of uh, honey and some crab apple jelly. So that one is always on my list to do. So again, but full, full year. Did I answer your question? Yeah, for, I think for the most part, I, I'm thinking more like the idea of you know, scheduling posts, um, and if there's a, you know, set regimen of what kind of posts, you know, weekly, or, you know, that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you want to make life really easy for yourself, then I, I don't, I don't post too often, because if you post too often, uh, you're not, you, you won't necessarily come across as quite as genuine. So at least once a month or every other month, absolutely um, write them up well in advance. So I can get everything, all my writing done in advance, because I already know I'm going to talk about swarms in the spring. I already know that I'm going to talk about the honey harvest in September. I already know that I'm going to talk about, you know, and, and then I, and I always pick, pick a political topic uh, to make sure that I, you know, you know, talk about, uh, you know, pesticides and and uh, land use and, and pollinators. And so I, I do that and then I spread it out and then absolutely um, have that if, if I'm busy, then I schedule it to appear. But I always leave room for um, crazy things that happen to beekeepers because I don't know if it's just me. But there's always something crazy happening, Jimmy, like at least once a month, something funky happens. Um, so I always leave room for that as well. So part scheduled and part kind of, you know, impulsive or whatever comes along. Amazing. Thank you so much. Great. Any other questions? And um, uh, thank you again, Michelle. Um, so much information. Um, and your your energy really comes through. And uh, um, I love, you know, sort of how you branched out in different ways, um, but still, um, you know, sort of in direct contact with the consumer. And um, you, you've actually created a great segue for me into this next section that I'm going to be talking about. And um, so 
Um, my uh, my section uh, today is on, uh, you know, just accessing and exploring some of those market channels. And um, I'm, I'm just really going to do a high level overview. But first, I'll just introduce myself. As Carolyn mentioned um, at the start, uh, I also am an agriculture and rural economic development advisor, and I've been with the ministry for about 17 years. And I have been doing uh, Selling Food to Ontario sessions with communities uh, and organizations since about 2012. And of course, it runs the full, you know, it's not like for it, for this, in this instance, we, we partnered with um, Melanie and the Beekeepers Association, um, but we've done a lot with uh, local food groups and municipalities and other organizations within communities. So, um, you know, lots of experience in this topic. And um, also, you know, over the years, there's so much interest in the kinds of information that, um, um, you know, that that our presenters uh, uh, bring forward and uh, so much uh, dialogue and, and the opportunity to learn from each other, uh, which is really the strength of having events like this. So um, very appreciative that we've been able to work with the beekeepers. Anyway, I will uh, move through this. Uh, so this is basically what I'm gonna cover. I'm gonna do that um, high level overview of different marketing channels. And Michelle, you've done a great job of uh, touching on really half of them and um, figuring out, you know, what channel is right for you. And then we do have some resources at the end that uh, uh, I won't really touch on, um, but they'll be there and, and these, pr this presentation will be available to you afterwards. So, you know, when you look at your market channel options, um, you really have sort of that direct marketing and, uh, you know, Michelle really spoke to a lot of that, um, uh, direct marketing um, and how uh, in in her business she has kind of finessed um, you know what what are the best direct marketing channels for her and her business um, but generally you know you've got your your on farm market your roadside stands um, a farmers market community supported agriculture they're often the um, um, you know the the most direct marketing channels. And, you know, Michelle spoke about ways to branch out, um, uh, again, using that direct to consumer marketing, um, but, uh, you know, using networking as a tool to um, expand your uh, market channels. So um, the other uh, side of it is sort of that more indirect marketing. And uh, in this space, it gets uh, a little bit more tricky uh, just on a number of levels, and I'm going to just touch on it briefly when in more detail. But um, uh, so that would be, you know, selling to restaurants, selling to grocery or retail, uh, broader public sector uh, uh, sales, and selling through a food distributor, a broker, or a food hub. So, um, you know, in gen anyway, we're going to talk about that. And, and um, uh, we also next week um, we're going to be talking about costing and pricing. So uh, Michelle, you kind of touched on that in your presentation as well, and so we're going to dig a little more deeply into that um, at the next section. Um, so a little bit, you know, I mean, many of you uh, are um, have likely done on farm or roadside stand or selling from your porch or you know that kind of thing, and. Um, uh, again, it's a great opportunity to share your story, to, uh, you know, get to know uh, your customer, for the customer to get to know you, um, and just recognizing that when you do, when you're working in the space, um, you need to make sure that you have the blessing of, say, the municipality, that your zoning allows for that, and you need to consider food safety and, and um, other things. Uh, so uh, a few things to consider when you're looking at, at roadside stands, but, um, you know, it's a, it's a really great, uh, great segue into um, figuring out the best way to market your product. 
So um, farmers markets are another option. And um, I suspect many of you uh, have used farmers markets. And in Michelle's case, using her example, um, you know, not just a farmers market, but perhaps an art show um, or some other event um, where people are gathering that sort of um, meet your target market. And, um, you know, another great opportunity to um, learn I, again, um, when I've spoken with people who sell at farmers markets, they often use it as a, a bit of a testing ground for, you know, perhaps it's, um, and sorry, I'm, I'm not an expert on bees or honey, um, but maybe you have new flavors that you want to try or new honey products that you want to try. And what, what they say is, is when they're looking, when people are looking to, when producers are looking to branch out, farmers markets are a great way to do that um, because you can get that immediate feedback from the customer and, um, uh, you know, it gives you some insight as to what's going to move off the shelf and what isn't um, or what will move more slowly. Um, so next off, we have community supported agriculture. And I know in the area that I live in, um, we have a number of, of um, uh, farmers who put together, uh, you know, food baskets that get delivered weekly. I think the biggest benefit for this is, is uh, you know, that you are uh, like you get paid up front. And um, quite often, honey is a product that is within those those community supported um, agriculture boxes or bins or baskets or whatever. And, uh, uh, you know, you have, you know, ahead of time what your sales are going to be. And it gives you some stability in terms of, of how much product you're going to move in that particular market channel. So uh, when we start looking at those indirect uh, market channels, uh, you know, restaurants and food service are one option to think about. And I, I would think like, um, you know, there are some restaurant, larger chain restaurants on that who um, are supplied by larger suppliers and who are not necessarily as flexible, uh, you know, in terms of product, but building relationships in your, you know, your community or your, your local area um, or beyond um, with the specific restaurants who support local, who have similar values to you, who can, uh, you know, using Michelle's terms, you know, can, can help you, um, uh, uh, like help support your brand, um, you know, looking for those and building relationships with those, uh, uh, you know, that's another opportunity uh, that, that can be considered. Um, another uh, area that that uh, we can take a look at is uh, as a market channel is grocery store or retail. And as you as you move into uh, selling at a at a retail level, um, you know the the uh, um, you may you may be facing um, what's the right word? You know, um, sort of more uh, restrictions. Your your uh, uh, you know, you're selling at a wholesale price as opposed to a retail price. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of a lot of sort of um, markers that you have to hit when you're going into, like, say, a larger grocery chain. Um, one thing I will mention here, though, is, um, uh, and I think it, it's, sorry, I think it's the next session. Um, we're also, um, OMAFRA, our ministry has a vendor engagement program with some of the larger uh, grocery chains like Sobeys and Metro. And there will be an opportunity to talk about, you know, how to get entrance into those, uh, you know, the larger national retail. Um, but one, uh, another avenue that is not, um, you know, might be a little easier to, to sort of break ground into is just looking for local retail where, um, you know, local grocery store is, um, you know, selling a lot of local product and very supportive, again, of local and supportive of similar values to what your company is supporting. And, you know, that might be an easier segue into the retail space. You're still going to have to look at your cost margins. And uh, we're going to talk about that next week. Uh, but, uh, you know, those are uh, health food stores as well. Like those are all options um, that you can consider. And, uh, you know, sometimes you may be faced with listing fees uh, 
and in some cases you can like I, I I've lived and worked in rural Ontario for many many years and um, you know there are a lot of small grocery uh, you know stores like even Foodland um, that takes on a component of local um, you know from from local suppliers and there there's often an opportunity there to have a conversation with the person that buys um, and uh, see if you can um, sort of make some headway into um, the smaller, uh, the smaller grocery stores. Um, broader public sector again is kind of another uh, indirect uh, and wholesale way of selling. Um, and and again, I think um, I would. My recommendation would be, you know, again, there 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 are lots of distributors that supply some of these places, uh, or probably most of these places, but. Um, there may be some opportunities to build relationships with, um, uh, you know, the, the, the buyer at the local um, seniors residence or, um, you know, long-term care facility. Um, we have worked uh, with someone um, out of Thunder Bay, actually, and he has been very, very active in promoting local product in um, and he works for uh, the municipality. And so in the municipally owned facilities, so there's long-term care, uh, uh, and I think one other one, um, he has been able to source locally um, and improve the diet of uh, people who are residing in the facility um, and, and, you know, sort of build these relationships with the local community uh, to provide local goods and products uh, for that, that long-term care facility. Um, and then there are a few distributors and brokers. And again, you know, it's, um, you need to do your research. Um, again, need to find someone uh, that can fit your needs. If this is something, uh, you know, sort of an, a, a channel that you're looking to go down, maybe now or you know, in the future, um, you know, what is your packaging and labeling look like? Um, do you have a story like a product sheet that tells your story, uh, you know, talks about the business, um, you know, nutrition facts tables. Um, and you, you know, again, it's really important to know your costs and uh, uh, case quantities and things like that. So, um, you know, I, again, another indirect way of selling uh, and uh, something to consider, you know, depending on where you're at in your in your business cycle. Um, and there are food hubs um, out in in the in the regions there, there are one or two in Toronto. Uh, there's one in um, uh, in Colburn near the Big Apple, uh, a few in Northern Ontario. And um, these food hubs can do a few things. Um, one, help you sort of um, package your product. If you're looking at value adding, uh, they can help you um, create um, and, and, and perfect recipes. Um, like if you're making products that contain honey um, and um, also be an, uh, provide an opportunity for selling. So think, thinking about all the different market channels, um, you know, the, the thing you have to do is, is think really hard about which one is right for you and your business. And so, um, you know, there are six factors to help you identify the right channel, um, you know, um, from sales volume, price risk, lifestyle preferences, uh, labor requirements, and channel specific costs. And all of these have some kind of implication on, um, you know, your, like, you know, we, you hear, we talk a lot about work-life balance and things like that. And, you know, just being really careful when you are choosing um, to broaden the marketing channels that you're using, um, you know, to expand your business, to value add, to do anything like that, is just think about the impacts on uh, uh, you and your time and and your life and your family and things like that. So those things are also really, really important. And um, I'm just gonna run through, um, and uh, Michelle touched on this, um, five tips for uh, market channel uh, decision-making. So it's really important to value your time. 
and and put a dollar value on it. I mean, yeah, you know, it's it's great to to volunteer and help get your name out, but when you're doing things as Michelle was saying with classes and um, you know, a day in the life and, and things like that, um, you know, your work your your work has value. So uh, make sure that you value the time. And um, another thing is to keep really good records so that you know that. Um, wow, you know, my, my steady sales are coming from uh, selling at those three local retailers and, you know, farmers markets and other shows and events, um, you know, they're a great supplement, but, you know, and the only way that you'll be able to tell that is by keeping good records. So, um, you know, always think about the six factors that I just talked about, you know, sales volume, price risk, um, and so on, um, you know, and and rank and compare and again the only way you can do that is by keeping records but you know which which are my most active uh, you know uh, uh, you know you can determine which one is the best by ranking and scoring them and um, you know just helping you to make decisions as to where you might go next. Um, and then, you know, as Michelle has done with, with her business, you know, um, she's combined a number of different ways, still staying in that direct marketing channel field, uh, so to speak. And, um, uh, you know, she, um, you know, you can look at multiple channels and, you know, you're, you're doing direct, um, direct sales right now. And that's maybe the space you want to be in forever. Um, but perhaps you want to branch out and go into retail and then you need to look at, you know, uh, um, very carefully how that's going to happen. Um, so I'm just going to run through a few resources quickly, um, that we have available and, um, uh, our, mine and Carolyn's, um, uh, contact information is at the end here. So just reach out to one of us if you would like uh, these documents um, and we're happy to provide links. Um, you know, there's a really good uh, business information bundle on value adding. Uh, we have some information on programs and services for farmers and business resource guides, uh, direct farm marketing, I think that was mentioned, um, and this actually selling fruits and vegetables might not be as relevant, but um, there is information in there on just farmers markets. And there is our contact information, uh, myself and Carolyn, again, reach out to us anytime to, um, uh, you know, if there, you have any questions. Um, you know, on, on any of this information that we presented. Thank you. So um, I am going to, our, our next up, we have um, a panel or, well, it's not really, a, it's, it's a, a virtual, think of it as a virtual panel. And um, we have three speakers who will be sharing uh, their story with us on market channels, you know, decisions that they made on, you know, moving from one to another, um, and just a, a bit about their story. And so we're going to be hearing from John Van Alten from Dutchman's Gold, uh, Emily Griffa from True Bee, and Gavin North from Honey Pie Hives and Herbals. So hi, yeah. everyone. Hi. <laughs> Welcome, Emily. Thank you. Thanks for having me. But just want to thank the OBA for putting this talk on. And uh, to Melanie for inviting me to speak. I'm really happy to share some of the strategies that have worked for us. And I don't have a slideshow because we're literally knee deep in honey, it's harvest season. <laughs> so I didn't get a chance to do a, a slideshow, but I'm happy to speak with you tonight and just share a few things. I made some notes, um, so just bear with me. And it's a good reminder in life and in business that it's okay, you know, things don't have to be perfect to be really good. <laughs> so. Don't wait for things to be perfect to get started and add value. So, okay. So um, a little introduction. So my husband and I um, are beekeepers in a little village called St. Andrews. We're about an hour outside of Ottawa and we run several hundred hives. We have quite a big apiary and um, we've been entrepreneurs and self-employed in beekeeping for over 25 years. So it is our main business. It's, it's really all we do is produce and sell our honey. And we've been in the retail space and packing it 
um, for over a decade now. So originally for a long time, we would sell it wholesale bulk to big national packers. And as we were growing our family and I became a mother and more interested in um, like the food system. And I you know, found out what was happening when our gorgeous Ontario honey was being bought and then perhaps you know, blended or adulterated before I got to the grocery store shelves, I became really passionate about um, packing it all ourselves and making it available to the community year round. And, uh, and that's really kind of what started um, us on, on building our brand. So that kind of leads me into, um, you know, my first strategy, which is building a brand. So you really want to have like a creative, create an attractive, unique label to you. And generic labels are available, but a custom label really helps build brand recognition and sets you apart from other products on a shelf. So, and I don't have a nice background like Melanie with a little OBS. <laughs> Again, I'm not techie, but I just, I'll show you our, our jar and our label. And this has been our label pretty much since we started actually. So we've had it a long time and we always get really great feedback on it from our customers. Um, and you also wanna be authentic. So sharing your story helps share your product. And there might be a little overlap with what Michelle's touched on with connecting to your customer, but connecting to our customers is really what's given us leverage to secure retail partnerships and brand loyalty. So I might touch on a few things again, but Michelle did a really great job um, talking about connecting to your customer. So again, you wanna be authentic. You wanna share your story, which helps share your product. And so what's your family story or your business mission or your ethos? And my husband, Jan, is a lover of nature. And if he could, he, he would literally live outside. And he, he loves working outside with the bees. And I'm passionate about health and wellness. So our business ethos is really sharing our love of nature and the bees and inspiring health and wellness in the community. And this is really at the core of everything that we do. So yours might be cooking with honey, you might be um, like a hobby chef, you um, might love sharing the culinary benefits, you might be passionate about our ecosystem and pollination. So whatever your reason and passion is for beekeeping, that is your story. And your story helps customers connect with you and your values. So you don't have to go out necessarily look for customers because they will be naturally drawn to you and your products based on your business mission statement and your values. And this goes for retail partnerships as well, which I'll elaborate on. So this doesn't mean that you don't have to, you know, put in the work to be visible and accessible, but it helps build an authentic customer following and a loyal customer base. So your story and business mission statement will also help you connect with food stores and retailers that share your ethos or values. And this helps again, build authenticity. So for example, we're partnered with New Grocery, which is Ottawa's first zero waste grocery store. They now have two locations and an online delivery service, and they're growing a significant zero waste community in the tens of thousands in Ottawa. And this is a perfect fit because as beekeepers, you know, we're environmentalists by nature, we have a very green footprint and we work with bees and contribute positively to the ecosystem. So this has been a really natural, authentic partnership for us. We were invited to be their honey supplier based on shared values. Um, another tip I have would be share your story with an online presence, whether that's a basic website or social media. I'm very active on Instagram and it lets stores and retailers know that you're active in the online community and you have a presence. Even if it's a small following right now, don't be discouraged. It just tells retailers that you're engaging with your customers and you're building that customer reach. I also recommend following your favorite grocer or retail stores on social media and engaging in their world. So support them, shop at their store, buy other local products and take a photo of your grocery haul and tag them, for example. Take a photo of one of your favorite items in their shop and tag them, but only do it if it's genuine and you really do love that product. So the key to building business relationships really is being sincere. 
Uh, another tip I have would be engage and be an organic part of the community. Um, Michelle touched on this really well. So you're a vital to the local economic health of your local community. And I know it can be daunting at first to sign up for things and participate at events, uh, like joining your local VA or local markets, fairs or festivals, but you are valuable and your product is of high service to your community. And people can't support you if they don't know your story, your values or the value of your products. So if you haven't already, I encourage you to establish and position yourself as the local honey expert or local beekeeper in your community. And this can be as simple as offering to give a talk on the health benefits of raw honey at a local health expo, volunteering at a school to do a beekeeping presentation, which Michelle touched on. And the point here is really just to engage and position yourself locally and become a honey and beekeeping kind of ambassador. So promote the art of beekeeping, promote the benefits of local honey and pollen, share honey recipes, you know, share bee info. And I personally always underestimate how interested people are in bees and the art of beekeeping. And I think it's just because I'm so immersed, like it's such a part of our life and lifestyle beekeeping that I truly forget how fascinated most people are about bees. So, um, and they always want to learn more. So, so keep sharing. And if there's no local festivals or markets in your area, start your own and sign up for health or food expos at the closest big city to you and your bees. And there really truly is huge opportunities to meet potential retailers at these health and food expos and shows. And you never know when you're offering a honey sampler tasting if you're speaking with a store rep or a store owner or buyer. Sometimes they'll give you a card, but sometimes they're just kind of covertly going around tasting, trying different foods, and they'll connect with you at another time. So keep that in mind. Uh, another thing that's been really um, successful for us is cross promotion with other brands. So I suggest partnering with other local makers and producers who make complementary products. So we've um, collaborated with kombucha makers, tea makers, people who make hot sauce, restaurants. Um, and this is a good way to market and build your brand and you're getting that cross promotion at the same time. So we've partnered with an award-winning organic soap company uh, who uses our honey in their Let Me Be Your Honey Bar. And this is actually an award-winning soap in France and they, they ship worldwide. We've also partnered with um, local can like candle companies, um, who use our beeswax in their candles, a holistic spa in Ottawa who uses our honey in their facial treatments. And the goal here is really to extend your market reach and your brand reach, which helps give you, um, you know, brand recognition. And this is really important to retailers because they're giving you really expensive real estate space on their shelves. And brand recognition is really key to legitimizing your business and your products. So it'll help you get in. And we're also partnered with some local CSA farms. And again, this is wonderful because it's cross promotion. We promote them. They use our honey for their CSA boxes. So we have all in you know, local community having access to our local honey. And then come winter time when there's no CSA box anymore, they can go, we can direct them to local retailers. So local retailers appreciate this because then we're sending them to local retailers, they've fallen in love with their honey over the summer, they want to continue using it over the winter, and we get to send them to uh, local retailers. So besides the most important part of having you know, our honey business, which is obviously caring for our bees and honey production, these really are the key things that have helped really establish us as a leading honey producer. And a, a lot of people will say to me when they hear, you know, we're in the we're, we're beekeepers, oh, you're in the honey business. And I always like to say, actually, I'm in the relationship business. So I just think it's really important um, to build these relationships in your community, um, at the stores you like to shop at. And we are, uh, you know, in some fabulous retail stores. We're in Whole Foods, Sobeys. We do private label for Farm Boy. They're, they're black label honey. And this has all really been done through. Um, building local and nurturing local relationships. So um, for Sobeys and Whole Foods, 
uh, we got into those stores because I attended a local health food expo and Sobeys was the sponsor. So they had booths there and one of the Sobeys store owners came by and tried our honey and loved it and got us in his store. And then other store owners, Sobeys like wanted our honey. Um, we met a contact through this health food expo that uh, invited us to the Whole Foods Supplier Summit when Whole Foods was opening in Ottawa. So um, again, by going to that health food expo, that was really the networking that got us into the Whole Foods um, Supplier Summit. And a little story too, when I was at the Supplier Summit being interviewed um, and kind of presenting our products, there was the vice president of distribution <clears throat> from the States that was down and he you know, listen to my little presentation. And then he kind of looked at me, he says, so what's your distribution strategy? <clears throat> and I looked and I said, well, honestly, I'm going to come, you know, my little mom van deliver your order. And then I'm going to go into the store and do my grocery shopping. And that was the truth. Like, that's what I would do. I'll, I'll, go, I'll come deliver it in my little car. And then I'm going to come in and do groceries here. And he actually, he loved that. He really loved that. So you don't need to oversell. You just have to be genuine and you have to be able to effectively communicate the value of your honey products is basically the moral of the story. Um, and same for Farm Boy. So I was a local shopper and fan of Farm Boy for years and their food philosophy really aligns with our mission and ethos. And so at one point I saw, because I always checked the honey when I would go shopping at Farm Boy. This is before we were packing and supplying them. And I noticed um, that the supply was kind of dwindling and every week I was going in and it wasn't being replenished. So I said, oh, I think, you know, it felt like the right time to introduce, introduce our honey. So I, I made nice little baskets and I went in to my local Farm Boy and talked to the local manager because I knew he knew me as a, you know, loyal customer. And, um, and that was kind of how we kind of got into Farm Boy, actually. Um, I, I saw an opportunity. And at this point, we were already in Whole Foods, which is really um, spoke highly to our food and safety certificates. But my point is, don't be shy to go for the big retailers first. So I made it known to them that I was a proponent of high quality foods at great value. And their slogan is, it's all about the food. And I really hit home that I'm a big proponent of like customer education and that I wanted to come in and do honey demos and honey tastings. And they love that. And that really, I considered myself to be like an ambassador of their store. So when you're partnering with retailers, again, make sure it's genuine and sincere. And it's somewhere you would actually want to shop and that you're going to want to promote. Um, and another little story I just wanted to share was, um, a little while, or this is going back now quite a few years, but we went to this little show that was taste of Ontario and we were invited to invited to participate. And it was really slow. Like, I think I probably opened more jars of honey for sampling than I actually sold that night. And I remember my husband came with me. Usually I was the one that would do the shows and, and he came and he was like, oh my goodness, like we literally opened more honey than we, we sold tonight. Like, how do you do this? Like, is this really? And I said, oh, you know what though? We don't know who passed by, who grabbed a card off the table or who. So, you know, for me, it wasn't really just about the sales, but about again, the networking and the relationships we were building, even with some of the other um, booths that were there and producers. And someone had taken my card uh, from our booth and had given it to the founder of um, the Ottawa Ladies Who Lunch group. And this is a large Facebook group, like 60,000 members. And she connected with me and said, someone saw you at Taste of Ontario and gave me your card. And she invited me to an event that was being held at the National Arts Centre and wanted me to have a little booth there um, with my honey. And so I did. And this has just led to a wonderful um, group of you know women entrepreneurs we all support each other there's real estate agents in this group that use our honey um, for their clients in their kitchens of their new homes florists who use our honey in their gift baskets and um 
And this really does help with retail because again, people are using your honey and then they need to buy more of it and they go to look for it at the stores after. So those little connections and, and those kind of um, networks really do help segue into brand recognition, brand loyalty, and um, you know what you're really looking for when you want to be in the retail space. And, uh, uh, Emily, I think we're at time here. So um, you, uh, your story is amazing. And I love that you have um, sort of been in you know, many of the marketing channels that we've talked about. And, uh, you know, the common denominator, the, the common thread that I'm hearing is that, you know, relationships and building networks are so critical um, mm -hmm. in this industry. So um, thank you so much for sharing. And um, uh, we're going to move on to our next speaker. And I'm just wondering, uh, John, did you get sorted out? Here we go. I can hear you. Thank you for inviting me, and I'm going to try and cram 41 years of uh, beekeeping <laughs> and honey marketing into 10 minutes, okay? Great. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, um, I really appreciated Michelle and Emily's uh, uh, talk there earlier. It, it reminded me uh, again and again of uh, early years of beekeeping and, um, and uh, opportunities that, uh, that came along. I... I um, I guess I'm a bit of an old codger and, and uh, you know, like, so we, we, we've kind of moved, we've moved on from uh, some of that, uh, some of that uh, relationship building. And uh, even though we're still doing it more on a, on a, a different scale, maybe. Um, but one thing I would say is that I've, I've never had a business plan. Um, unfortunately, uh, I, yeah, I, I don't come from a business background. Uh, I don't come from, uh, I come from kind of a, a wannabe hippie background and I, and, uh, and uh, a business plan was never really a part of, uh, a part, part of what I was. So, uh, but I did always try to say yes when opportunities knocked. Uh, okay, here we go. So our humble beginnings. I'm going to focus a little more on infrastructure than on the actual day-to-day -day, uh, sale of honey or, you know, the actual day-to-day -day of marketing honey. I want to kind of give you a, a short uh, idea of how, how we evolved uh, from a infrastructure and from a, a beekeeping uh, point of view. Um, in 1981, we purchased 300 colonies from a Dutch uh, beekeeper neighbor uh, that was a beekeeper. Uh, I'd never looked inside of a colony of bees in, in my life, um, but it looked like a pretty interesting uh, hippie type thing to do. So um, that's what we did. And the, uh, the gentleman that sold us the bees in the house uh, offered to stay and mentor me for two years. And uh, that was the beginning of my beekeeping career. Uh, the equipment that we bought, of course, we knowing nothing about beekeeping, uh, uh, in retrospect, was, was very old and very, uh, very decrepit, actually. Uh, but uh, we, we managed to make it work for a few years. Um, we started in, in, in a, like we, had, we bought a house and it had a, a little bit of a shed in the back, about a 600 square foot shed that uh, was our honey house and honey packing facility at that time. Um, we had bees in the backyard and we, and we had about, I guess we had about 10 out yards, uh, where we, uh, it, within about a, let's say a half hour drive of, uh, of our house. Um, the, uh, honey crops were, uh, very slim at best, uh, mostly because of my lack of beekeeping skills. Uh, we had to do a lot of work, a lot of a lot of heavy lifting and a lot of, uh, um, yeah, what, what should I say? It, it was, it was a lot of manual labor and, uh, and again, for very little honey at the end of the year, um, which in itself was a bit of a blessing because it forced me to look at other avenues, uh, of, of, uh, turning, um, uh, turning what was actually not a very profitable business into, uh, something where I could uh, feed my family with. 
So we turned to, uh, because we didn't have uh, a reliable honey crop, we, we, we decided we would start to buy honey from other beekeepers to make up for our shortfall. And, and that way we could grow our, we could grow our markets. Um, uh, we would sell mainly to uh, health food stores and to, um, uh, to farmers markets. Um, and so we would have a, we, we needed to have a year round supply of honey. And, and uh, so we relied on other people's expertise in beekeeping and producing big honey crops uh, in order to uh, uh, supplement our lack of our lack of uh, knowledge and and um, and our and our small honey crops the first few years. Over time, though, we uh, we did start to grow our beekeeping operation, and 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 uh, even though my beekeeping skills still weren't the greatest, I, I could hire I could actually hire uh, very experienced beekeepers, and uh, that's when our beekeeping actually started to become a little more profitable. Where uh, people that actually were better at it than uh, than I was. One of the problems when you're trying to do everything is um, the the days when you should be out in the bee yard, you're 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 stuck in a in a van trying to sell honey, and then the days when you're not selling honey, it's raining, and uh, and there's always conflicts like that on 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 trying to trying to manage your time so that uh, you can be very efficient. So as we grew, we tried to hire people so that we could. Um, we could uh, be more efficient and 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 run a and run a beekeeping operation that uh, that uh, worked well. So we started into candle making as well. Um, oh, sorry. And our little retail store in Carlisle um, started off as a, uh, a as a, a table out front, a help yourself table, and slowly it more it started to grow and grow, and and finally it started to take over. Uh, a good portion of our residents. Um, we were still operating out of the little, well, actually, no, we, we added about uh, 1,200 square feet to the 600 square foot building in the back. And, and so we were operating, doing most of our, doing most of everything out of the, uh, out of the say, let's say 2,000 square feet. Um, it was, uh, it, it, it got to be a little bit crowded and the, um, and the, the store uh, started to take up more and more of our living space. So after about 30 years of, of operating primarily from this location, we, we managed to buy a farm about a 10 minute drive away from our, our uh, establishment in Carlisle. We kept the Carlisle establishment because the retail there was, was doing very, very well and we used and we were able to use the other buildings for other for other projects. Um, so we bought a farm that had a barn that needed a lot of work, and we converted the barn to a uh, a beekeeping building and an extracting plant. By this time, we were running about fifteen hundred colonies of bees, and we were doing a lot of pollination work. Um, and um, as well as uh, as well as bottling honey and and everything, so the beekeeping was becoming a a bigger and bigger part of our business. Uh, we added a four thousand square foot storage building, uh, and uh, as as your beekeeping business grows, uh, the need for storage grows exponentially. Um, we should have built this one about eight thousand square feet, but. Uh, we managed to make it work with 4,000 4, square feet and, and good high ceilings so that we can stack everything quite high. Um, we renovated uh, and added on to uh, a, a drive shed that was on the property as well. We insulated it all, uh, put in good floors and offices and loading dock. And uh, this has become our, our main uh, honey honey. Uh, bottling plant uh, on the on the farm. Uh, we've had, of course, uh, as you grow, you you need more and more office uh, office uh, space and office people. All the different um, all the different uh, things you need, like CFIA registration and uh, a, a bunch of different a bunch of different things that you need in order to sell into some of the uh, some of the markets. Um, 
some of the accreditations that, that, that with interesting acronyms that I can never remember. Uh, but uh, we, we have several uh, accreditations that uh, allow us to sell um, into uh, some of the bigger markets that, uh, that require those uh, accreditations. So this is our uh, bottling plant from the other angle. It's a, about 9,000 square feet. Um, we do everything now with forklifts on uh, everything is palletized and um, we have a bottling room that uh, we can uh, we can process honey now that uh, we, we only dreamed of when we when we first started. Um, so but again, you got to remember this is 41 years into uh, into uh what started as a small business and kind of grew uh, as we uh, as we went. Again, everything is pelletized. Uh, all the honey comes in in, in steel drums now, and we we have to uh, process them to uh, meet the standards for a number one um, uh, product. Um, we also offer a large variety of other products related to. Uh, honey and, and beekeeping, uh, skin creams, uh, beeswax candles, um, honey blends. We blend honey with uh, things like cinnamon and raspberry and uh, a number of other things. Um, skin creams, again, I, I forgot, um, lip balm. These are all extra little things that uh, help us to uh, help us to be a little more attractive to a buyer uh, that might might want a variety of products uh, and it gives us a little more leverage. Uh, I should mention, we also diversified into uh, maple syrup bottling. Uh, we have a CFIA registered uh, maple syrup plant uh, in Carlisle in our old facility. Uh, we, we, had, we, we converted that to our maple syrup bottling plant. And uh, so that gives us a little more Again, a little more something to sell to the majors if we're looking, uh, if we're looking to, if they're looking for a, a supplier. And I guess this is our distribution strategy here. Um, we this is one of our trucks that goes on the road uh, and goes in mostly into uh, Toronto and, and the GTA area. Um, again, we're we're fairly fortunate, and our location is is very central to the GTA. Uh, within a half an hour, we can be in any number of uh, in, anywhere from Brampton to Toronto to Hamilton to uh, Cambridge. Uh, we're, we're very central to all these places. So I'm, I'm guessing we're central to about uh, six or seven million people. Um, John, I just want to mention that we're at time. Yep. And I've done. I just wanted to mention my... Uh, my wife's business uh, on the farm as well. Allison's uh, uh, Tuckamore Bee Company. She's a, a fantastic queen producer, and uh, she's got lots of energy to produce queens, and uh, she does a great job at it. And uh, anyway, there's a Langstroth hive in that in that uh, hollow hollow log, and uh, it's also quite an attraction for people to uh, come and see the bee tree. Anyway, thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm uh, really interested in hearing the stories that we've heard tonight. And um, uh, John, you're I I love how you've transitioned and diversified, and um, you know, gone through so much learning in in order to uh, uh, make such a successful business for yourself and your family. Um, you know, you said something in your presentation about, you know, feeding your family and, um, you know, that's such an important element of consideration in all of this, right, is how these decisions are impacting feeding your family and also, um, you know, that whole family life, right? So um, thank you so much for sharing. Um, Gavin, I think you're up next. And thank you everyone for your patience as we're moving through. I, it, it's just, it's really hard to not, um, uh, um, you know, to try and stay completely on time because the stories are that are being shared are so good. Absolutely. Well, I'm gonna keep Thanks, it pretty Gavin. brief. I don't have any, uh, any slides to show you. I do have this cool background and I just wanna clarify, these are 
scones, they they look kind of like giant chicken nuggets. So sorry oh. about that. Sorry about the mess here. But um, yeah, thanks for having me. And thanks so much. Uh, really interesting to hear from the other presenters, um, uh, all of their their perspectives. And, and I think the one thing that everybody mentioned in terms of marketing is your story. Yeah, we really found our story was what really connected us with with store owners and with customers and with everybody we've talked to over the years, <clears throat> excuse me, our, our um, apiary situation is a little bit different because we started out with 15 hives and that was 22 years ago. We got our hives in 2000 and um, we uh, set them all up in Prince Edward County here. So uh, we're in Prince Edward County, which is about two and a half hours, three hours east of Toronto. And um, we, we always had the goal of, of expanding our hive numbers and uh, finding, finding more customers, but, but we really wanted to keep it a, a small operation. And, and really, um, although we were interested in, in finding some retail outlets, we focused on a lot of our sales from the beginning as being fairly direct to customers looking to go to uh, craft sales and farmer's markets. Uh, and types of things like that. Um, what we found was because we were in Prince Edward County and it was <laughs> 2000, um, there, there weren't farmer's markets happening here. Uh, there was a real culture in the area of roadside stands. In fact, in, in the county here, there was a map you could get of all the roadside stands, which was really cool. And, and people love that experience going and seeing the farms um, and, and checking them out personally. So it was really hard when we approached other farmers to get a local farmer's market going. And we tried many, many times over the years. And um, we, in fact, um, found ourselves uh, after a few years of doing some local sales and some uh, direct sales through CSA's Community Shared Agriculture. We started to drive to Toronto every Saturday and uh, first do one uh, Witchwood Barnes Farmer's Market. And then we, we added on the Brickworks when they opened up their farmer's market there. And we did those markets for uh, over a decade um, or the Witchwood uh, for over a decade. And it was a ton of driving. But at, at that time, as I say, there really wasn't much of a culture here in the area except for some church craft sales and things, uh, opportunities for us to sell directly to people. Um, so we did end up going to lots of local stores and uh, health food stores and places like that and selling our product. Um, but we also had the benefit of not just selling our honey. Um, right from the beginning, we made um, uh, herbal products as well. We're honey pie hives and herbals. So uh, we uh, grow herbs and dry them to make herbal teas and use the herbs in our soaps and uh, uh, salves and other, other beeswax products. Um, so we were able to kind of um, market uh, to some stores and to some people a variety of, uh, of products, later getting into candles as well, but it took us a few years to kind of get into that. Um, and, and one of the things we tried to do um, was um, uh, we had our, our labels are, are very beautiful and specific. You can see a little bit of, of one of them over here. Um, my wife is, is a talented painter and she draws all the labels. I modeled for this one, uh, the after dinner tea, but they all uh, had a cohesive aesthetic style. People could recognize our branding. Um, uh, we, we looked at it as kind of a traveling salesman kind of style, an old fashioned, um, like the old print ads. Um, and we um, really wanted to focus on the beauty of what we were doing and, and showcasing, because we're a herb farm, showcasing not just the bees, but also the flowers themselves and talking about how, um, how important the, bee, the flowers are uh, to the bees' health and their nutrition. Um, and of course, going out and doing farmer's markets, we found that people really just come to us with questions. We didn't really have to uh, have anything prepared to talk about. They had tons of questions about, about the bees, uh, particularly as we know over the years, as they've been in the media, um, uh, people uh, have had a lot of concerns and, and so obviously are drawn to, to talking about that. But uh, we also found that our personal story was a lot of what we were selling, you know, just people uh, love to hear about 
um, our story. Um, I moved uh, from Toronto out to the country. Um, and so I had a huge learning curve with beekeeping. Um, like John's story, we started off uh, kind of in a, in the hippie world a little bit. And uh, over the years, uh, Bay and I started beekeeping together. And over the years, she's um, focused more on the, the product making and the, and the taking care of the gardens. And I've become the, the head beekeeper, uh, the head drone, as uh, we call me here. And, um, w- you know, we've been around now long enough that people do know us as, um, I think Michelle mentioned, as uh, the beekeeper in the area. So we're lucky enough to um, field questions now from uh interviewers uh, writing about neonicotinoids um and also uh i'm happily i'm invited usually each year to go and speak to elementary school kids um so much in that way people know us and and we have the benefit that when we started out in 2000 there weren't too many other folks keeping bees in the area there were a few older beekeepers who had um who had given it up at the time and there were a couple of young guys that uh um uh kind of shared their knowledge with us and it really helped us get started. And, uh, and uh, at the time there wasn't really much consumer literacy uh, in terms of some of the specialty products we were making um, and some of the natural body care products. Whereas now 22 years later, we've seen a, a, obviously a huge difference um, with the advent of web 2.0, uh, people have a lot more vast kind of uh, base of knowledge and, um, and, and are, are interested in, in our products and our price points a little more. Whereas uh, 22 years ago, um, we, we kind of had to convince people that $4 wasn't too much to pay for a bar of soap. Um, and now we, our bars of soap are priced at seven or $8 and we have no, no problem selling them to people and people order them online and stuff. But uh, back when we started, there wasn't uh, a web channel for sales and we had to go and, and find uh, places to sell. I had my mom selling jars of honey at the hospital. She worked at a friend of ours that lived in, uh, in Toronto in a nice neighborhood would organize these monthly parties, like kind of like home, like a Tupperware party. Um, to uh, showcase our products and we would sit down and literally drink tea and and got a crash course in direct sales with people and so um, we got really good talking to people through uh, farmers markets and stuff like that Um, and then later when we opened a a farm store here at our farm we uh, you know we started to do lots of great events Um, we have a, a mead and pie tasting event in the fall that we're going to bring back this year um, because obviously we haven't been able to do it in a few years. That's a great way to get people down and to check out our, our location and and to visit our farm and stuff. Um, I mentioned the mead. We got into making mead um, seven or eight years ago now. And uh, that's, that's been really great. Tons of, of uh, new customers are coming. So interested in talking about the process of mead because it's something people are only uh, kind of vaguely aware of uh, so much to talk about um, to the Game of Thrones people and the Lord of the Rings people that come up the driveway. Uh, it's it's fascinating the the people that we get to talk to, um, and uh, you know of course the other types of things. We were at the um, local fair with our uh, local bee club, the Quinty Beekeepers. We were talking to people at Picton Fair, and one of our beekeepers brought out a display hive. And that was great because I was representing my company, but also um, just talking on on behalf of beekeepers and talking about uh, some of the problems we're having with, uh, you know, habitat loss and um, uh, industrial farming and things like that. So we, we try to engage with people, you know, not just about what we're doing in our products, but about uh, the situation our farmers are facing and, and the ecology as well. So, uh, yeah, please check us out at honeypie.ca. And uh, uh, thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to talk. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much, Gavin. Um, I, I do want to mention as well that um, Gavin and Bay with their company um, did receive a regional award, um, a premier's award for agri-food innovation. Uh, and it was for your mead, I think. Yes. Um, and it must have been early, like um, early days when you were just starting to produce mead, I think. 
Yeah, so, that, that was a while ago now, but that, that also was a great, um, you know, a great way to find customers. And we, we got a, got a real bounce from the press releases and uh, the opportunity to, to go out and, and talk to people about uh, our process of meat making as well. Thank you. Um, you know, it's been, it's been really great. Um, uh, there, there are some really common threads here, I think, uh, through the presentations that we've heard tonight. And um, I, I think the sharing of, um, you know, not, I mean, I, of course, the sharing of knowledge and information tonight, but um, it seems um, like that there is a lot of education that um, is, is pretty grounded in everybody's uh, business, you know, sharing uh, what what you're doing, sharing why you're doing it, and all of that, and um, just some uh, really really great stories. And thank you so much to everyone for sharing. Um, I'm just <laughs> uh, Carolyn has posted the link for the evaluation. Um, does anyone have any final question? Um, what do you do with honey that crystallizes on the retail shelves? Oh, crystallized honey is like my favorite. But anyway, um, customers avoid solidified honey thinking it has gone bad. Do you just swap out? And is the OBA educating people that crystallized honey is still safe to eat? Does anyone want to tackle that? Michelle or Emily or Gavin? Or well, John? I'm, ha I'm happy to address it because um, anybody who talks to me by the end of it, um, is is uh, choosing crystallized honey because it spreads better on your toast and it's easier to measure and um, they get such an earful from me and we talk about the crate rates of crystallization and I show them the beautiful um, the oh I forget what it's called but it makes those beautiful spiral patterns of crystals on the sides of the jars and so I think that I I can't honestly say that I have ever had anybody. Um, talk to me and think that the honey had gone bad because I just flood them with education to share with their friends. And I, um, my target market is totally on board with it. And I have people ask me, um, do, you have, do you still have some honey from last year? Because I prefer it when it's crystallized, it spreads better on my toast. So I think that if you're coming across anybody um, who doesn't understand the crystallization process, a, a simple and a, a education from a positive side. I, I don't talk about it from the negative. I talk about the, all the positives of it. It, it. it should really go away quite quickly. Like, I mean, I, it, it really just isn't an issue. I can't really say I've ever had anybody uh, after they've chatted with me ever think anything. About I, I, I think um, um, part of this question is around like, you know, when you are supplying a retailer and, um, uh, you know, if there is honey, that, like you, you don't really have the opportunity at that point to, um, you know, to, to be, have that one on one conversation with someone. Um, and so is there is there some way? Uh, so, uh, you know, for those who do sell retail, when I used to work for uh, I used to I used to um, work uh, and I used to teach the Williams Sonoma salespeople when I was a chef, how to use pressure cookers, but another one of my little sidelines. And so educating the staff and I would be going into any of the ma major chains and I would be running education series and I would do a honey tasting with all of the senior level buyers and anybody who's important and who has the opportunity to teach. And then I would in be including crystallized honey as part of the honey tasting because the way that it melts on your tongue and the way that the fl flavors progress um, in, in crystallized honey compared to liquid honey um, is, is it's, it's, a, it's something to appreciate. So I really think it's, it's just about getting in there and, and educating. Uh, Emily, do you have any comments on the, on that question? Like, because you were, you were selling into retail, right? Um, yeah. Did I unmute myself properly? Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Hear you loud and clear. Um, so yeah, that can be an issue. We certainly had, um, you know, either customer feedback or sometimes a retailer will send us a picture and say, you know, this is what it looks like. And to Michelle's point, customer education um, is so important. And that's why I am a huge proponent of doing like honey demos, going into the stores when I can, so I can engage with the community and, and do that kind of teaching and, and promote honey for the health, you know, 
health food that it really is and explain what's happening when it's crystallizing. So we do have um, times when we will switch it out if it's really an issue for the retailer, like we stand by our products. So we, we do have a policy where we'll switch out if that's what they want, but we are really good at communicating and we do find it's getting better and better. Like more people are really connecting with their food. So a lot of people that are searching and looking for local honey tend to be, you know, educated consumers, but the teaching never stops. Like it really is, um, part of the read that I love to do honey demos is really connecting with people and teaching them all about the beautiful properties of honey. Thank you. Um, something else comes to mind for, for me, I, I mentioned we have um, the vendor engagement program, which is, uh, you know, building relationships with Sobeys and um, Metro and, you know, Emily, you touched on it. One of the things that they do um, encourage uh, when they're bringing in a new uh, product um, is that very thing of doing demos, right? And, and having tastings and having the, the producer in the store, you know, with a little display and being able to explain some of these things. So, um, Irene, if you're attending next week, um, our colleague Meg War is going to be speaking about that vendor engagement program. I think it's next week. Uh, Carolyn, Melody, nod or <laughs> affirm. Um, anyway, um, I, I, it might be a good question to ask him as well. So, um, you know, as to how, you know, uh, people like the retailers like Sobeys and Metro are managing, you know, sort of those opportunities for education. Um, we did have a question earlier on uh, insurance and uh, Melanie um, is going to um, respond to that. Yeah, I um, I responded into the chat there, but there is liability insurance available from um, uh, the cooperators through a group program that we run at the OBA. Um, as a group policy, it makes it really affordable for everyone to be able to participate in that liability insurance. I've heard uh, from several people that when they went on their own to to an insurance company to get their own liability insurance that it was astronomical in the rates that they got back. So uh, because we have such a large policy and it's been existing for, for many years, it's, it's quite affordable and it does cough, cover um, honey. Um, if you do have um, creamed honey and whatnot, it's still honey, but if you have flavored honeys, um, it is something that you have to make a special request for. And that's just something that you can discuss with the representative. So um, yes, the standard policy only covers honey, but that doesn't mean that other things are not covered. You just have to discuss those options with our representative. Great. Thank you, Melanie. Um, and there were a couple more comments about the, uh, uh, the crystallization and uh, uh, Johnny mentioned that they switch theirs out and their sales actually increased. So, um, and then Gavin mentioned that uh, uh, their honey, it, they highlight the fact that their honey is unheated and unfiltered and that the natural crystallization is proof of that. So, um, and Melanie, I'm not sure if you can speak to if the OBA is doing any education on um, this point. I, yeah, we do. Um, we put in uh, like a honey promotion article into the Toronto Star with Global Heroes. It also went into the um, Globe and Mail and into the National Post. It was all about how to store honey, um, that crystallization is normal, uh, that uh, if you yeah, just sure. give it a warm bath, um, sure. it... Uh, um, will go back to liquid if so you want it, but it's not bad. Um, we do have a honey pamphlet as well that goes over all that information. And our OntarioHoney.ca website does cover some aspects of like why the term pasteurization is out there and that it is for that crystallization. Um, but it is, yeah, just something that you can kind of even put a little sticker on your jar or a little label that says, hey, if you see crystallization, it doesn't mean it's bad. Um, it just needs to, it just needs a little warm bath. Great. Thank you. Um, I, the other, uh, there was a question earlier as well on uh, labeling and uh, that's uh, Carolyn had posted um, a link to CFIA and um, 
I, I, sorry, I haven't scrolled back to get your name, but um, if you wanted to reach out to me, I have a, I have a contact at um, CFIA who is um, into honey, um, direct, you know, works in, in on the honey file or whatever you would call it. So um, please reach out to me and my email will be um, on the presentation or just reach out to Melanie and she can uh, connect you to, to me. So I'm not seeing any more questions here. Um, so just next week, uh, we're talking about the business of bees and uh, there'll be a section on business planning uh, and then that uh, the whole uh, costing and pricing conversation. So we're gonna be doing that next week and our colleague Maguar will be there to talk about business supports um, through OMAFRA. And uh, I guess our... Uh, third session is on consumer trends and marketing approaches. So um, we have a number of different uh, speakers again for that session. And um, our last session is um, actually talking about getting it on the shelf and how to get your product into some of those retailers and uh, the small independent grocers and or find some wholesale options. So thank you so much, everyone, for staying with us. And uh, uh, thank you to our presenters for uh, sharing your story and your passion. And um, I, I don't know, it makes me almost, well, it makes me definitely want to learn more. It's a great uh, group of people I'm finding out um, that have a real passion for uh, what you do. Thank you so much. So thanks everyone for joining us and thank you to the speakers. I thought there was just, as Karen has said, there was so much valuable information and you really can't replace those life lessons of going through it on your own and then sharing that um, it, through any sort of presentation. So we appreciate that. And so we'll, we'll sign up for the night, but thank you everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye everyone.